All right. Good day, everyone. This is Daniel from Weaveworks. Thank you for joining GitOps on AWS, our weekly series of webinars and workshops. Today, we're going to be going through high availability and disaster recovery on EKS with Tiffany Wang, who's one of the customer reliability engineers here at Weaveworks. You can go to the next slide. So we are in webinar format. So what that means is you are in listen only mode. There will be a Q&A session following this presentation. And if you do have questions, please do use the Q&A functionality at the bottom of your Zoom panel. Um, and we will do our best to get through all of those uh, after the end of this webinar. Um, and again, thank you for attending. Next slide, please. So Tiffany has been with Weaveworks for a bit as a CRE. She's been working deep down in the guts of Kubernetes and EKS for some time. And today we're gonna to be diving into one of our more popular and a little bit more advanced topics. And she's gonna be walking us through some of the benefits of setting things up for HA and DR and how to do that. Um, we will be following up this webinar with a hands-on workshop on Thursday at the same time. That's 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, and 6 p.m. GMT if you can attend. Um, there is limited availability for that and we will be sharing further information at the end of today's presentation. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Tiffany who is gonna take us through today's content. Thanks so much, Tiffany. Thanks for the introduction, Daniel, and hello, everybody. Um, I'll just dive right into it then. Um, great. So we worked um, and if you're attending this webinar, you might have heard something about GitOps before. Um, but WeWorks created the term GitOps uh, to describe a method that we used internally to create a re resilient, reproducible production system. And ever since we defined our set of GitOps principles and methodologies, it's been widely adopted by major companies around the world, um, including the major public cloud platform providers. Um, and WeWork's core foundation can be grouped into these three categories. Um, you know, we're enabling GitOps across the Kubernetes landscape. And you're probably familiar with a lot of the open source projects that WeWorks has created, um, such as Flux, Flagger, EKS Cuddle, Scope, WeaveNet, WeaveCortex, Kubediff, just to name a few. Um, but our engineers are also active contributors to other open source projects, such as Prometheus and Kubernetes Special Interest Group, CNCF, CNCF projects like Cluster API. And we fundamentally support and contribute to open source cloud native. We also provide many services to help teams take advantage of cloud native and all the technologies involved. Uh, we're pragmatic in, uh, and focused on accelerating success, focused on design, consulting, and delivery of Kubernetes, um, and helping teams adopt GitOps and Kubernetes through training, and ultimately assisting and optimizing your platforms. Our commercial products, such as Weave Kubernetes Platform, or WKP for short, help teams to use cloud native letting them focus on building their applications while our technology helps them operate their clusters. We help to build your infrastructure and your cluster components following GitOps strategies, um, and I'll cover this later in the webinar, um, but we help to streamline your application development to deployment time, um, making your applications and deployment pipelines more robust and reproducible. I'll speak more about WKP and a company that's adopting WKP as part of their cloud and on-premise solution, but WKP makes it possible to manage hundreds of clusters um, in a repeatable, flexible manner. As GitOps Cloud and Kubernetes experts, Weaveworks is sought after to help companies and teams achieve the full benefits of GitOps and Cloud Native. We educate and enable teams, engaging with teams across cloud native and Kubernetes projects. And we help teams to design, build, and operate their Kubernetes platforms and provide training, 
consulting customer reliability engineers such as myself to work alongside your team. We're dedicated to getting your teams up and running on best practices and reduce time to deployment, mean time to recovery, and ultimately empower your engineers. We are cloud and on-premise on platform agnostic and able to support all major cloud platform providers with our flexible open source technology and it's compatible with other Kubernetes offerings as well. We also offer Leaf Cloud, which assists with automation, observability, Prometheus metric storage, alerting, and continuous delivery. Leaf Cloud packages up some of our open source technology um, and also provides a UI that gives you at a glance comparison of your different environments and visual cues to let you know if you have, for instance, images that are out of date. To give a bit of background to the topic of today's high availability and disaster recovery webinar, we can consider the cost and complexity of building out high, avail high availability in data centers. And some of you on the call might be all too familiar with the management that comes along with hardware that needs to be duplicated across locations um, and the physical issues in building out a high availability solution there. With cloud providers, um, they help to build out virtual machine infrastructure and answer some of the high availability issues by allowing for near infinite scale. But some aspects became complex um, or continue to be complex, including things like security and networking. Um, and those issues needed to be addressed. And then came along containerization and Kubernetes as the orchestrator of those containers. This solved more problems and streamlined the application layer. You're able to define a set of services um, that make up, that comprise your business needs, that address your business needs, and Kubernetes solved a lot of the underlying challenges, for instance, networking, and these solutions were essentially opaque to the application layer, um, allowing for focus on business needs. And now we're going to be talking about EKS and managed Kubernetes services. So with managed Kubernetes services, such as AWS's Elastic Kubernetes service, um, more aspects of high ability, a high availability <laughs> became res the responsibility of different cloud providers. In its infancy, Kubernetes was quite challenging to manage, especially when you had a lot of different services and had to deal with things like scheduling, the control plane, API servers, etcd, and backing it up. But with managed Kubernetes, there are some major benefits that come right out of the box. With EKS, um, some major pain points with managing your own Kubernetes are handled for you. The onus, for instance, of managing Kubernetes upgrades and patching is taken up by AWS with zero time with zero downtime upgrades. And another benefit that EKS gives you is high availability with a regional cluster. EKS runs the Kubernetes management infrastructure across multiple availability zones and detects healthy, unhealthy control plane nodes. WeWorks then created EKS Cuddle to further simplify the adoption and usage of EKS. We created it initially for internal use, but today it is the official CLI tool for EKS cluster creation supported by AWS. Later in this webinar, I'll walk through some of the ways that you can use EKS Cuddle to quickly create EKS clusters against configuration that you specify and ways that you can enable GitOps in those EKS clusters. So I've mentioned GitOps quite a few times already. Um, and for those of you who might not be familiar with GitOps, these are the main principles. It's a method that unifies deployment, monitoring, and management where the entire system is described declaratively. 
The desired state is versioned with Git and developers can stay in the workflow that they use every day. All intended operations are committed using pull requests. The typical approval process enables changes uh, to be applied to your system um, and all the differences between intended and current state are observable. Instead of manually uh, monitoring and detecting drift, we have software agents available to us um, in this uh, case, Flux, and Flux will ensure the correctness of your cluster and alert you on any divergence. Here's a diagram that sort of describes GitOps, an operating model for cloud native, um, and this just illustrates some of the key tenets of GitOps. You'll notice that there's a separation of concerns between continuous integration and continuous deployment delivery and any changes that you make to your system are transparent, auditable, and reproducible at any step along the way. <clears throat> and authentication and authorization is also isolated between concerns. And the risk that you might have once experienced is solved by the fact that GitOps makes rolling back to previous um, well-known good state really straightforward since everything is defined in Git. An added benefit of following GitOps best practices is that it makes it easier to make your system highly available and capable of recovering in disaster scenarios. Your desired state is stored in a single source of truth, a Git repository. And now I'd like to show you how you might create an EKS cluster. One way that you can specify your cluster configuration is by defining a YAML file with several components. Here, I'm creating a very, very simple EKS cluster. I've specified the name of the cluster, the region that I want to create the cluster in, and I've also specified that I want to create one node group with 10 nodes. However, without any of these specifications, EKS Cuddle will create you um, an auto-generated name, It'll create you two M5 large worker nodes, um, like I'm using here. Um, but we found that the in, that this instance type um, suits most use cases and is pretty good value for its cost. And EKS Cuddle um, Create Cluster will automatically use the official AWS EKS AMI. It'll use the US West 2 region. It'll create you a dedicated VPC and also use a static AMI resolver. So to actually create the cluster then from that configuration YAML that you just saw, it's really simple. Um, you just specify the EKS cuddle create cluster, um, dash F for the file that you want to pass in for the configuration, which I called cluster YAML. And your cluster will begin to create. There's a lot of helpful output um, that uh, you'll see as your cluster begins to come up, but you can see that this output includes the EKS Cuddle version, the region, the availability zones, the AMI, the Kubernetes version, um, and finally, a line letting you know that your cluster has been created. Once your cluster has been created, um, if you've got kubectl and AWS IAM Authenticator um, commands in your path, then you're able to use those cluster credentials that EKS Cuddle will add to your kube config, and you'll be able to kube cuddle to um, uh, look in your cluster. Um, and if you've installed EKS Cuddle using Homebrew, this should happen automatically. I'll show you this. Uh, later on. So you have your EKS cluster, but if you want to make sure that your cluster is ready to support GitOps before you've deployed any applications, Get EKS Cuddle makes it really easy to install the GitOps Kubernetes operators. With GitOps, then, your EKS cu clusters are repeatable. So EKS Cuddle has the concept of profiles, 
which are very powerful in that they make best practice sets of tools readily available to you. For instance, um, there's an app, a sample app dev profile, um, and if you install it, you get an AL ALB ingress controller, a cluster autoscaler, Grafana, Prometheus, FluentD, and an AWS CloudWatch agent um, for log collection, aggregation, and analysis. So using those profiles, you can create multiple clusters from that one profile. So how can we get ops the EKS cluster that we've just created? This command, EKS cuddle enable repo, with the arguments of the cluster name, the region that you've specified, git user, your git email, and the git URL of the uh, git repository that you want to use. Um, this command will create some Kubernetes resources on your behalf, um, and you'll get the GitOps operator that way. You'll see that this output, um, which I've truncated for the purposes of this slide, um, specifies that manifests are being generated as well as a namespace flux, um, and those manifests are then applied. The Helm operator, um, which you see are, you know, waiting to start and then started successfully, and then also flux agent, these are what we refer to as the GitOps operators. You'll notice that the Helm operator is deployed and started as well as the flux agent. And just for um, quick background, um, the, help the Helm operator is a Kubernetes operator that allows you to declaratively manage your Helm charts um, and Helm releases. And it's commonly used with Flux um, with the intent to automate your releases using a GitOps strategy, but it's not necessary to use the Helm operator with Flux. Um, with Flux then um, is the tool that allows you to automatically make sure that the state of your cluster matches what is defined in Git. So the way it works is it uses an operator um, in the cluster to trigger deployments in Kubernetes. So you don't need to use a separate continuous de deployment tool. And Flux is capable of monitoring all the relevant image registries um, that your CI pipeline finishes and pushes images to. Um, and it can also detect new images and trigger deployments and update the repository um, that holds all of the deployments, uh, the manifests or the Helm charts, Helm releases, what have you. Um, it's able to write back to that Git repository. Some of the benefits of using Flux um, include the fact that your continuous integration agents um, have restricted access to your cluster. You also get atomic and transactional changes and an audit log stored in Git. Every transaction either succeeds or fails very clearly. And Weaveworks is actually working on our GitOps toolkit and Flux version two. Um, which will further expand on this capability by raising notifications for success or failure of the changes. Everything is controlled in code. But before Flux can start committing back to your repository, you'll need to add Flux's public SSH key to your Git repository as a deploy key. And I've just taken a quick screenshot there to just uh, demonstrate what this looks like in GitHub. And You'll notice that I'm using GitHub for the purpose of this webinar, but as long as it is, you know, controlled by Git, um, enable repo should be able to work for you, um, whether you're using Gitty or uh, GitLab. Um, it should be able to uh, populate the, your Git repository um, that you specify with the GitOps operators. Now, the next time that Flux syncs from Git, it'll start updating the cluster and um, actively deploying. At this point, um, as I mentioned before, you're able to use kubectl um, 
so that you can see what pods you have in your in the cluster. You'll see that there's a lot of pods here, but what I wanted to show in this slide is the fact that there was a namespace of Flux that was successfully created. And in that Flux namespace, we have the Flux agent, the Flux Helm operator, and the memcached uh, pod that stores the current configuration of your cluster. And these pods are, as I mentioned, all in the Flux namespace. Um, So in beginning to address um, or continuing to address some of the high availability um, aspects of the webinar, um, we've created an, one EKS cluster that's highly available within this region. However, by using EKS Cuddle and profiles, um, it's pretty trivial to create EKS clusters in different regions. To solve for highly available multi-regional clusters, there are more considerations that we will discuss uh, in a few minutes. But essentially, if you have a load balancer or have implemented multi-regional service mesh and you have a global Route 53 service in AWS, you're able to begin building out sort of the most commonly seen uh, multi-regional uh, highly available HADR architecture. In each EKS cluster, you can include all of the tools that would allow for continuous delivery. Um, in this image, I've just put Flux there, visualization of your cluster, and that's what Scope gives you, um, and progressive delivery, which Flagger is a great tool for, along with all of your workloads. And again, all of this would be defined in Git. <clears throat> So earlier, I created the EKS cluster using a config file, but you can just create just as easily use the CLI tool to specify the configuration of your cluster. And on this slide, um, I've just included some uh, basic flags that you're able to set, but EKS Cuddle is a living, breathing project, um, and more and more capabilities are added with each release. And you can check them out for yourself by just um, adding a dash H or dash dash help at the end. Um, but you can also add other flags um, or define in configuration files um, ways to manage node groups, how you want to manage your cluster upgrades, how you want to auto scale the cluster, how to configure VPC networking, um, if you want to specify an AMI to use, um, and also you're able to define your IAM permissions uh, boundaries, as well as IAM policies, manage IAM users and roles, and create IAM role and service account pairs. <clears throat> the next few slides will cover some items that you need to consider when you're designing a highly available system that handles disaster recovery scenarios. And since each scenario uh, and each company's systems are unique, it's difficult to prescribe any one set of recommendations for HA and DR, but the following slides will cover some things that you need to think about. Um, and we'll talk about some options for load balancing and configure load balancing configuration, um, persistent storage, and authorization. And what I'll mention here, since I've just mentioned that EKS Cuddle can, um, can help you manage IAM, um, is that you can add IAM users, Kubernetes roles, um, Kubernetes role-based access control uh, to your EKS Cuddle profile. And we'll be sharing docs at the end of this webinar to go more in depth to cover your uh, more granular needs. So beginning with load balancing, um, there's a couple of different options, um, and this is by no means a complete set of options, but just some, um, some options and some caveats or some things to further consider. So the first bullet point uh, mentions multi-cluster networking, um, and 
One thing to note here is that layer two only affords you so much information as it is very low level, but you can accomplish it using tools like WeaveNet um, and AWS VPC to VPC networking, uh, where the VPCs in each cluster are aware of each other. <clears throat> and you can also use uh, multi-cluster service meshes. So um, the service mesh that would allow you to connect uh, services, service meshes together um, include Istio, Cilium, and I think that Envoy is in the process of also allowing this to happen or um, going to be deploying updates. Um, but I've also mentioned previously in a slide that there's the sort of most commonly used method of classic load balancing um, using Amazon Elastic Load Balancers and Route 53 to your ingresses. Um, and it's probably the most well-known technique. Um, and the following questions just sort of um, raise more questions depending on the services that you'll be running in your cluster. So do you need session awareness um, when a client makes an HTTP request to a service? Does there need to be some kind of affinity towards for that request to be routed to the same service in that particular cluster? Um, and in this case, you probably won't be able to use multi-cluster networking because layer two is a little too low level. You don't have all the information at hand. And so you'll need something layer four or above. Um, and do you need progressive, deliver progressive delivery? Um, and do you want it between two clusters? Um, in this case, you'll have to consider um, service mesh so that things like Flagger can deploy canaries um, and progress de uh, deployments through each cluster um, depending on um, each, uh, depending on which cluster it gets to first. And if you desire a single control plane, then the problem with that is it, that one control plane will then control the networking and you're not able to accomplish the classic load balancing um, option. So persistent storage is a particularly challenging um, issue in Kubernetes. Um, some examples include, you know, stateful sets, and those are isolated to a single cluster. And then with things like persistent volumes and PVCs, those are further restricted to a single node in a single cluster. And so I've listed some considerations on this slide that should probably uh, be taken into consideration um, throughout all of your high availability and disaster recovery design. Um, situations, but um, you do need to understand and uh, have a well-defined recovery time objective. So how long you have to recover, uh, also your recovery point object objective, or how much data you're allowed to lose during any failover or cutover, and service level agreements. What is the expected um, performance of your application? And depending on these, you'll be able to grasp what kind of a system you'll need. Um, and you'll also need to consider things uh, like cost of the solution that you come up with. Um, for instance, if you have an active active solution that would guarantee high availability and if one cluster should go down, the other is active and traffic can be routed immediately. But this is a particularly expensive way to solve this problem. And you know, other considerations are um, in industries like healthcare or financial data, you probably have more stringent requirements and some of the options uh, listed below might not work for you. But in general, um, our recommendation is typically to externalize the data from your cluster as much as possible. And if you do have data in the cluster that you don't rely on it being there, um, and some solutions and options here uh, specific to AWS include um, things like Aurora, um, RDS, S3, et cetera. 
And we've also included some recommendations in terms of service level replication, um, user databases replication capabilities, um, and for shared storage replication, um, the ones that we've listed here are part of the Kubernetes container storage interfaces, uh, CSIs, and thus they're Kubernetes aware. And in the disaster recovery scenario, you can consider, you can imagine, you know, having like a primary cluster that handles your full workloads and a sec secondary cluster that can be scaled up um, and, you know, receive any snapshots or perform a backup and restore, but these things do tend to take time. Um, and if you're doing performing things like log shipping, um, shipping your databases, operations logs from one database in one cluster to another, um, you need to consider, again, your RPO um, and the very nature of taking snapshots um, means that even if you're taking snapshots um, every second, there's a potential for loss of data. So um, one of the companies that WeWorks is continuously working with is Deutsche Telekom. And, you know, we are helping them um, with some disaster recovery uh, so solutions, um, but we're also helping them with their goals of creating a new platform that addresses the needs of 5G and the need to become more efficient. And they have a lot of different applications that are written by third parties, which makes for a lot of difference in the implementations. So it's even more important to have a standard platform so that they can standard, standardize their holistic approach. And while they rely on on-premise platforms, uh, they also want to be cloud aware and use uh, public clouds wherever possible. And to date, our customer success and engineering teams have helped Deutsche Telekom build out this reliable platform um, that, uh, that integrates with storage and virtualization vendors that they have already invested in. And You'll see under the key takeaways that they've adopted GitOps um, and that ensures the reliability and reproducibility and efficiency um, in that there's reduced time to deployment. Um, and with WeWorks help, they've crafted a platform based on WKP that is simple for different teams to use. So I mentioned at the beginning that I'd be going over WKP a bit more in depth. Um, and we are continuously building WKP and we have several different clients that are using WKP. Um, and you can see here that there's a few things um, that WKP will give you. And um, it looks like we're doing pretty good on time. So I might be able to go through a bit of a demo of the WKP management UI with you. But with WKP, you're set up to succeed um, because you get GitOps by default. So it builds on GitOps, adds enterprise features that we commonly are asked to create, um, implement with our different clients. Um, and to use WKP, it's quite simple. Um, initial setup commands, just create a Git repository on your behalf, including all the code that was required to create your cluster. Um, and it's a curated platform, so it's compatible with managed Kubernetes and it allows for, you know, instant operations and easy scaling to fleet. Um, and it does use uh, a model-based system, which I, which is akin to the profiles that we talked about with EKS Cuddle. Um, but to, oh, and this image here is a screenshot of the WKP management UI and just demonstrates that from the management cluster, you're able to see the list of all the different clusters that are managed um, 
um, in one UI. So to better illustrate WKP and the different components that it's comprised of, here's this diagram. Um, at the bottom, we begin with you know, automation for your infrastructure. Um, and if you have already defined um, your infrastructure needs using tools like Terraform, um, we're able to uh, build on top of that. Um, and in the core platform, um, we use models to manage multiple clusters um, and ensure that we're using GitOps to create and maintain your cluster configuration. And the add-ons include tools right out of the box to ensure that you've got things, um, pretty basic things like uh, Prometheus metrics, um, um, monitoring with Grafana, um, logging, Helm, and visualization tools right from the start. And I'm going to see if I have my WKP cluster. OK, great. So can everybody see my screen? Yes, yeah. I've been sharing this whole time. Sorry. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> so here's the uh, management UI, uh, a sample management UI for our WKP um, cluster. And you'll notice here that some of the cluster components that I mentioned get installed with EKS Cuddle profiles. Um, you know, things like uh, Grafana, Prometheus, Scope. Um, these are given to you right out of the box. And in fact, we go one step, oh, I haven't authenticated, but out of the box, you're able to have Grafana dashboards that show you things like your nodes, your pods, um, the services in your cluster. Um, scope will give you um, a really good uh, visualization of all the con containers that you have running in your cluster. Um, and uh, pr with Prometheus, you're able to do, um, you know, set up your alert manager um, so that you get alerts um, if anything goes wrong in the cluster. Um, and just to show you, this is the clusters tab um, to show all the different clusters that can be managed from this uh, management cluster. Um, and these are some example models that um, are akin to the EKS Cuddle profiles. So you'll see that for a production cluster, these are some sample components and applications that you might want to include for a machine learning cluster and for search components. You know, um, you can create different models with a set of um, tools, components, and applications that you want to create your cluster from. So that was just a quick demo. And as I mentioned before, um, WKP is cloud agnostic, and it's also um, capable of handling on-premise. Um, and so it's also, sorry, <laughs> it's also got GitOps all the way through. Um, and with GitOps, you're able to scale these models that you've created. Um, and it's modular and flexible. Uh, and some features and advantages are that your operations are reliable, they're secure with GitOps, and they're, you obtain agility through one common platform that can be used across all your different teams. Um, WKP does provide multi-tenancy um, and deployments, deployment capabilities specific to um, individual teams through uh, team workspaces. Um, and with WKP, you're able to have more streamlined deployments and also reliability. 